Hey everyone, welcome to Judging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my daily ruling. Today is this month's patron pick, and I've gotta say, they chose an awesome topic for me this time around. As you already know, we're gonna be talking about dependencies. So, get ready and strap yourselves in for an awesome topic. Now, when I first got this assignment, I've gotta say, I kinda felt a little bit like somebody asked me to come up with an easy way to teach the sevens times tables to people. And, well, you know, all the experts said it was impossible. But the experts never met Judge Dave, and that means that there's got to be some kind of a way to at least make this topic that's generally seen as a gigantic rules boogeyman maybe a little bit more approachable. So I'm not going to say that I could teach this stuff to a chimpanzee, but at the same time, I definitely think that the way that dependencies have been taught in the past is definitely, well, a lot more technical than it had to be. So that was one of the things that I really tried to focus on when I made this presentation, is I wanted to make it such that uh, it was a little bit more approachable to somebody who had uh, just a, a general knowledge of how this sort of stuff worked. Uh, now, with that being said, I will uh, uh, say I am presupposing a little bit of knowledge about how continuous effects work in general. Um, so if you have not seen my presentation, Continuous Effects in Three Easy Steps, I would highly encourage that. Um, that should give you all the background information that you need in order to make sense of what we're going to be going through uh, in this presentation. So, okay, first uh, question on the docket, of course, what are dependencies, right? What are dependencies? Now, really, when you boil it down, uh, dependencies have one job, and, and it's to be a tool that we can use to help us answer the question, which continuous effect applies next, right? Now, with this question, there's a lot of stuff baked into it. So if you were to think about um, why we need dependencies, and that's something I definitely go over uh, in, in the presentation that I referenced, one of the real primary purposes of dependencies is to make it so that continuous effects have the correct outcome. Um, what I mean by correct is uh, something that makes sense to somebody who doesn't have a lot of background in the rules. And so when we have a question of which continuous effect applies next, uh, the goal, uh, or at least the goal from the magic rules and policy team perspective is to make it so that the correct answer to that question is the answer that everybody thinks should be the correct answer for that question. Um, and dependencies is a tool that we use to, to do exactly that. And we'll talk a little bit more in the presentation about how that happens um, through a couple of examples here, but that's basically what dependencies are and why they exist. Okay, so what other tools do we have? Well, layers and timestamps. That's a, a short uh, and sweet answer to that question. Um, if you uh, were wondering what the three easy steps were, that's that's them, layers, timestamps, and dependencies. Uh, so those are the tools that we use to decide which continuous effect applies next. And the important thing that I wanted to point out here is that dependencies always take precedence over timestamps if a dependency exists, uh, but never over layers. Uh, in fact, one of the prerequisites for being a dependency is that both of the continuous effects have to apply in the same layer. Uh, so this is an important thing to, to take note of. If there is a dependency, then it will always take priority over what the timestamps say, but it will never take priority over what the layers say. Uh, the layers is always step one, no matter uh, what other easy steps we might want to apply. So, okay, that's, that's good. Now, um, this is what the rules say uh, about uh, how, how to apply dependencies. Um, this is taken straight out of the comprehensive rules. Um, I kind of tried to distill that down into something that I thought was a little bit more approachable uh, for, for someone who's not like a super rules nerd <coughs> like myself. Uh, so this is it. And in my opinion, this procedure that I have on this slide is exactly equivalent to the procedure that I had in the previous slide where I copied it straight out of the comprehensive rules. Uh, now, I am not going to be 100% confident that I couldn't have overlooked some sort of a really weird corner case uh, where it turns out they're not actually equivalent. If you know of such a thing, definitely uh, be sure to uh, let me know about it because I'd be very interested in hearing about that. I'm sure it would be a really excellent topic for a future daily ruling. Uh, but for certainly all purposes that could come up in a, a real game of magic, I'm pretty confident that this should be exactly equivalent. And uh, again, if somebody knows of a, a time when they would not be equivalent, definitely let me know. So this is the, the thing that I came up with. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write down all the continuous effects that need to apply in a list. And then we're gonna choose one of the continuous effects from that list uh, in order to apply. And then we're gonna apply that continuous effect, cross it off, 
and then keep going until we've applied through all of the continuous effects. Now, one of the interesting things that I want to point out with this procedure here is that uh, the list order is not set in stone at the very beginning. Uh, rather, what happens is after we apply every single continuous effect, then we have to check to see if there's any new dependencies that applying that continuous effect caused to happen, uh, or indeed if there's any dependencies that used to exist but now they don't anymore. Um, and so that, that's something that I think is kind of interesting and, and not generally something that a lot of people uh, think about when, when they're learning the, the dependencies. And, and that definitely makes sense because it's not something that comes up a whole lot, but let's just say it might come up in the next few minutes here. Um, so yeah, that, that's the procedure and we're gonna definitely have a lot of practice using this procedure uh, through the rest of this presentation. So okay, now what does it mean for a continuous effect to be dependent on another one? That's, I guess, the last piece of the puzzle uh, that we're going to need in order to start, you know, actually applying this to some real live questions involving real life magic cards. So a continuous effect depends on another if it applies in the same layer and sublayer as the other effect. Remember, we talked about that before. Uh, applying the other one would change the text or existence what it applies to or what it does to any of the things it applies to. And neither is from a CDA or both of them are from CDAs. Um, and otherwise the effect is considered to be independent. So again, this is the actual text pulled straight out of the comprehensive rules. Um, but again, uh, well, I'm, I mean, personally, uh, for, for me, this is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, a, a little bit on the challenging side to read through and understand what's going on. So I'm sure that, uh, um, it would help some people if, if we actually went through some examples. So what I like to do uh, is, is in cases like this where the comprehensive rules has like a really dense thing that it wants us to try to figure out, um, what I like to do is I will go through clause by clause, sentence by sentence, and, and talk about exactly uh, what's going on with some examples. So uh, let's, let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to work on identifying dependencies here. And one of the steps is, uh, uh, the, the first thing that we talked about is it has to be applied in the same layer and sublayer as the other effect. So Bloodmark Mentor and Mindbend uh, would be an example of uh, non-dependency. Uh, so these are not dependent upon each other because they are not applied in the same layer and sublayer, right? The Mindbend has a text changing effect, uh, which takes place in layer three, whereas the Bloodmark Mentor has a, uh, ability adding and removing effect, which would take place in layer six. So because these two are not applied in the same layer and sublayer, they are not uh, an example of a dependency. And uh, you could see that otherwise they would be, right? Um, the the mind bend definitely does change uh, what, what this effect does, but we have layers to fix it so that these apply in the correct order. So we don't need dependencies to, and remember that was the whole idea. That was the whole reason why dependencies existed uh, was because we needed a tool to be able to do something like that, right? So there, there we go. That's uh, that's that. Um, applying the other would change the text or existence of the first effect. And of, of course, I really needed to have Blood Moon and Herborg in here. Um, again, this is like if you go in the Judge Vault, this is like the dependency question, right? Like um, pretty much everybody who's heard of dependencies has also heard of this uh, example here of a dependency. So uh, the reason that this is a dependency is because applying Herborg. Um, is going to make every land into a swamp. Uh, but applying Blood Moon is going to make every non-basic land, including Urborg, into a mountain. And when you make a non-basic land into a mountain, that is going to take away all the abilities uh, that that non-basic land had. And so as a result, we could say that if we apply Blood Moon first, then that would change the text or existence of Urborg effect. So that would mean that Urborg is dependent on Blood Moon. And so that, that would be an example of, of how these uh, types of things would work. So, okay, good, good. Now, uh, another thing that could happen would be applying the other would change what the first effect applies to. Uh, so here we have Conspiracy and Fairy Conclave. Again, these are both type, subtype, or super type changing effects. So if we have Fairy Conclave and we animate it, um, then that is going to change the Fairy Conclave from being a land to being a land creature. And if that is the case, then that would mean that conspiracy, which only applies to creatures and does not apply to lands, uh, is going to have the things that it applies to changed, right? Because we go from fairy conclave not being affected by conspiracy to fairy conclave being affected by conspiracy. Uh, so that would mean that we could say that the conspiracy depends on fairy conclave uh, 
and that is the reason why, because applying the fairy conclave would change what conspiracy applies to. Um, or applying the other would change what the first effect does to any of the things that it applies to. Uh, and so this here is the example that I uh, used for this one. And I, I feel a little bit dirty, right? Because this is the exact same example that I recycled right out of my other uh, continuous effects presentation uh, for when I was talking about this. If somebody else knows of a reason, uh, a another type of continuous effect dependency that relies on uh, this clause here, I would very much be interested in that because uh, I thought about it. I, I looked and I thought about it and uh, I couldn't find any. Uh, I, I could not think of a continuous effect dependency other than this sort um, where applying the other first would change what the first effect does to any of the objects that it applies to. Um, so we'll, we'll talk briefly about uh, exactly how this works if you haven't seen that. So the idea would of course be that, that we have the seal enchantment enchanting the control magic and then the control magic enchanting some other creature like a grizzly bears. And so the idea, of course, is that if we apply the steel enchantment first, then that is going to change what control magic does to the grizzly bears that it applies to, right? Because if we apply steel enchantment, then that is going to change which person the you in control magic refers to. So the control magic would ordinarily be giving control of the grizzly bears to the person who played the control magic. Uh, but... If we apply the steel enchantment first, then that's going to make the control magic uh, give control of the grizzly bears to the person who played the steel enchantment. And so, therefore, we have a, a change in what the first effect, in, a, in this case the, the control magic effect, does to any of the things that it applies to. Um, and so, this is also, uh, incidentally, this is the example that I... Uh, kind of my go-to example for if somebody asks me why dependencies exist. Uh, and this is a really good um, example of why we need dependencies, right? Because what'll happen is um, if we just go based off of timestamps, the control magic is almost certainly going to have an earlier timestamp than the steel enchantment, right? Uh, because like in order to play the steel enchantment, you would need the control magic to already be in play. Um, but if that's the case, then, you know, we would apply the control magic first and we would give the grizzly bears to the control magic player. Uh, and then we would apply the steel enchantment and we'd give control of the control magic to the steel enchantment player. Uh, but by that time, the control magic is already applied, so giving control magic to a different player doesn't really do anything. Uh, so with that being the case, we know that uh, we've got a really weird situation because the, the control magic and the steel enchantment are both controlled by the same player, but the grizzly bears that the control magic is attached to is controlled by a different player, which obviously does not make a whole lot of sense. And so situations like that are the reason why we tried to put dependencies in. Um, and of, of course, otherwise, the, these are both in the same layer, layer two. Um, so we would be considering timestamps as, as the, the thing that decides which one goes first. So if we didn't have dependencies as a way to override timestamps, um, we could end up with situations like that happening where the control magic isn't doing what it's supposed to do and somebody different from the controller of control magic controls the thing that control magic is attached to, which obviously is completely crazy. Um, okay, so neither effect is from a characteristic defining ability or both of them are from CDAs. Um, now, this is a really exciting example. I actually came up with this example specifically specifically for this presentation here. Um, and it, as far as I know, again, this is the only like real uh, way that you could have something like this come up. So we'll, we'll uh, briefly go through here. We've got Changeling here uh, from the, the Firebelly Changeling, which, which says that it has every creature type at all times. Uh, and then we have all goblins are zombies. Right, and then there's some other stuff. But the, the all goblins are zombies is the thing that applies in layer four, uh, which is the, the same layer as, as what Changeling applies in. Right, now, let's notice that if we uh, applied the Changeling first, then that would make the Firebelly Changeling into a goblin. And so therefore, that would change what cards the Drownleaf's Crusade is able to apply to. Uh, so other than this, this point here, uh, these two meet all the other criteria for having a dependency. That being, they both apply in the same layer, uh, and applying one of them first is going to change what objects the other one applies to. So, therefore, we could say that a dependency would exist between these two, and the, the changeling would have to go first. Uh, however, again, the, the purpose of dependencies is to make it so that if you uh, have two continuous effects that are going to apply in the wrong order, uh, the dependency is going to fix it to make them 
apply in the right order. Uh, however, because the changeling is a characteristic defining ability, uh, there's another rule that specifically says that characteristic defining abilities get to apply first. Um, and so that would mean that the, the fire belly changeling is in fact uh, going to have the, the changeling apply first and then the, um, the goblin uh, turning into a zombie continuous effect from Drowning's Crusade is going to apply after that. So uh, why is uh, this different? This, this is another uh, kind of a, an aside thing here, um, but I, I thought this was kind of an interesting point. Um, and I, I only noticed it when I was doing the research for this question. So if you notice uh, the, the, two, the two printings of Drowning's Crusade here, this is the uh, you know, only version of it that actually has a physical printing. And this is one that I made up um, based off the Oracle text. Uh, so you can see there's a, a slight change in how it's worded. Um, what is the purpose of this change and, and what are some of the consequences of it? If, if anybody would like to, to pause here and, and think about uh, that question before I just tell you what the answer is, uh, go ahead. But um, here, here's the answer. Uh, you, you can obviously see that, that goblin creatures get plus one plus one has been pulled out of this ability in the oracle text. And the reason for that is because when Lauren Block came around, uh, it became possible for there to be uh, goblin creatures or rather goblin permanents that were not creatures. Right, uh, so this being pulled out from this ability means that this one only applies to goblin creatures. So therefore, we're not going to be able to give our bogart shenanigans plus one plus one, uh, which it's not really clear what that would do. But you know, that's a thing that could happen if we didn't pull this out. Um, now, there's another consequence of that 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 may or may not be intended, um, which has to do with the fact that uh, this is now considered to be a different ability from this. And what that is, is this rule here that says if a effect, a continuous effect should be applied in different layers, then the parts of each one apply in the appropriate layer. Um, and so if an effect starts to apply in one layer, then it continues to apply to the same set of objects in every other layer that it applies in. And so this is something that's going to come up uh, a couple more times in this presentation here, let's just say. But right here, I wanted to, to highlight what happens because this uh, uh, part is all in one continuous effect here, then all goblins are black and all goblins are zombies in addition to their creature types. Both of these are going to apply to the same set of objects. So if we go back to the Firebelly Changeling example, um, because Firebelly Changeling is a goblin at the time when this continuous effect is applying, that means that it will also become black. Uh, and again, this is uh, regardless of what the timestamps of those two uh, entering the battlefield were, uh, because the, the continuous effect from a characteristic defining ability is going to apply first. Um, and so therefore, what that means is that the Fire Belly Changeling will always be black, um, because when the Drawn Loose Crusade started to apply, then the uh, Fire Belly Changeling was a goblin, and so therefore this part the part that makes it into a zombie, in addition to its other creature types, is also going to apply. Um, and so that's that's kind of interesting because um, even though the, the Fire Belly Changeling is already a zombie, so this part doesn't really do anything, you might be tempted to think that the whole thing doesn't do anything. So, But, but actually, no, because it started to apply to the Fire Belly Changeling in Layer 4, it's also going to apply to the Fire Belly Changeling in Layer 5 when it's making all the goblins black. Uh, whereas if it did not get to apply to the fire belly changeling in that layer, it would not be applying in any subsequent layer because of that rule that we just saw. Now contrast that with the goblin creatures get plus one plus one, which is its own separate continuous effect. And so what that means is that the goblin creatures are always going to be getting plus one plus one, whether or not this ability uh, applied to them in layer four or not. So that's kind of interesting, and it is a, a functional change from how things worked in the printed version of this card. Uh, again, I'm not sure if that's something that was intended or not, but it definitely is something that's interesting to think about. All right, so now let's go on to a couple of examples where, where you can work on your um, ability to identify whether a dependency exists or not. So we're going to start out with something that's kind of, um, well, you know, you, you might call it a little bit of a silly example. Uh, but I think that it's also kind of helpful to see exactly like what the simplest kind of scenario uh, where, where some of the stuff that we're talking about could apply in. So the idea is this. There are two bludgeon brawls on the battlefield, right? Uh, and then we have like some other non-creature, non-equipment artifacts too. So 
if we apply one of these bludgeon brawls, it doesn't matter which one, obviously, because they're the same card, um, but if we apply one of them, let's notice that that's going to turn each non-creature, non-equipment artifact into an equipment. And so that means that after this bludgeon brawl applies, there's not going to be any non-creature, non-equipment artifacts in play because the non-creature, non-equipment artifacts all got turned into equipments. And so that means that this bludgeon brawl is going to apply to all of them, and this one is not going to apply to any of them. Um, now, obviously, this, you know, it's kind of a funny, you know, junk example because... Uh, you know, the end result is the same, right? Like, everybody already knows that if you have two Bludgeon Brawls in play, it's going to be the same thing as if there was just going to be one Bludgeon Brawl in play. Uh, but not a lot of people think about this this interesting aspect of it, which is that only one of these Bludgeon Brawls is actually going to be applying to any permanence at all. Uh, the other one is going to apply to no permanence at all. Uh, and it's because of what we had just talked about. So uh, because of that, we could say that one of these depend or uh, each of these Bludgeon Brawls is actually dependent on the other one right? Uh, because if you apply this one first, that changes what objects this one would apply to. Whereas if you apply this one first, it changes which objects this one applies to. Uh, so we go based on timestamps. So that's that's kind of interesting. And this is, uh, a, you know, for the fact that it is an obvious answer, uh, it, the stuff that happens in this question is actually kind of interesting, right? There's a dependency loop. You've got, uh, you know, most people wouldn't even think there's a dependency at all. But, you know, yeah, that's kind of cool. So maybe we'll, we'll move over to something... Uh, Let's see, a little bit more practical. Uh, so here, here we've got like a Bludgeon Brawl, but we also have the other card being a, a March of the Machines, right? So let, let's take a look at this one here, and, and we'll notice um, that if we uh, apply the March of the Machines first, then we're going to have that same sort of situation we talked about with the Bludgeon Brawl, right? Because if we apply March of the Machines, then there's not going to be any uh, non-creature, non-equipment artifacts left. Because after we apply March of the Machines, then every non-creature artifact is going to turn into an artifact creature. Uh, so therefore, we could say that the March of the Machines um, is going to change how many objects the Bludgeon Brawl applies to. So therefore, we would say that Bludgeon Brawl is dependent on March of the Machines. Uh, now, conversely, if we apply the Bludgeon Brawl first, then all the non-creature, non-equipment artifacts are going to turn into equipments. But they're still going to be uh, non-creature artifacts. Uh, and so therefore, we would not have the same thing going on uh, in the opposite direction. Uh, that is to say, March of the Machines would not be dependent on Bludgeon Brawl. So because of that, we've we've got these two uh, um, in play. Then if, if we had something that the March of the Machines could apply to, then the March of the Machines would be um, the first one to apply. So we'll we'll talk a little bit more about like what the uh, you know what the end what what it would look like when they apply uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, but for now, let's just focus on like identifying whether a dependency exists. So here we've got another kind of an interesting situation. We've got uh, Titania Song and March of the Machines. And these two are very similar um, in that uh, they both do the same sort of thing. Uh, but the Titania Song has uh, something interesting extra added into it, which is that they also lose all of their abilities. Um, and it also has this like kind of wacky old school uh, card sort of thing where like the, the continuous effect continues until the end of turn, even if Titania Song leaves the battlefield. Uh, so that's kind of interesting, but it's not going to really come up here. Um, but but we do have the same sort of situation that we had with like the two Bludgeon Brawl example, right? Right. So we have the the March of the Machines. If we apply that, then that means that all the non-creature artifacts are going to turn into artifact creatures. If we apply the Titania Song, that means all of the non-creature artifacts are going to turn into artifact creatures. So uh, we have the same situation where each of these continuous effects is going to be dependent on the other one. Um, and so... Yeah, again, we'll talk later in the presentation about exactly what's going to look like uh, when, when those are applying, but uh, we definitely could say that a dependency exists between these two, and, and it's in both directions. Okay, so now um, we've got a, another dependency of like kind of a different type here, uh, which is which is Flutter Fox and, and Dress Down, right? So uh, if let, let's notice that if we apply the, the Dress Down first, it makes the, the creatures lose all abilities, and these both apply in their six. Um, because we want to give Flutter Fox fl Flying, which is a ability, and we want to lose all abilities from all creatures, so that's also uh, adding and removing abilities. So if we apply the Dress Down first to the Flutter Fox, then that's going to remove this uh, ability. And so therefore, it's not going to have a continuous effect that wants to give Flying to Flutter Fox. 
And so what that would mean is that we could say that applying the, the dress down first changes the text or existence of this effect. And so therefore, uh, there is a dependency. Flutterfox uh, would be dependent upon the dress down. And so it would always apply after. So, okay. Now, this is a, a kind of similar to another type uh, uh, of example that I wanted to go over, but this is actually a non-example. So, right, so this is a, kind of a similar example to that last one, right? We have uh, levitation in play and we have a dress down. Um, and let's say we have like a grizzly bears or something for these to both apply to, right? Now, if you notice, uh, creatures lose all abilities. Grizzly bears has no abilities, right? Um, and because of that, it might seem like there's a dependency here, right? Because if you have a levitation that's giving grizzly bears flying, then we might be tempted to say that that changes what dress down does to the grizzly bears. Uh, but in fact, it's actually doing the exact same thing, right? The, the dress down is going to be taking away all abilities from grizzly bears. And it's possible to do that even if the creature has no abilities to start out with. Uh, so what we're really doing is we're changing um, how relevant what the dress down does is rather than changing what it does uh, to any of the things that it applies to. And so with that, uh, if we take a look at the actual uh, text from the comprehensive rules, we can see that indeed uh, it would need to change what the dress down does to the grizzly bears. And in this case, it's not doing that. It's just changing how relevant removing all abilities from grizzly bears is. Uh, so in fact, there is no dependency. Uh, and if we, if we were to have a, a levitation and a dress down out, uh, we would be applying those in timestamp order. Okay. So now we're ready for some practice, right? We're, we're going we're gonna to use this procedure that we had talked about here uh, to determine the, the end result of some continuous effects. And I've, I've got some you know, really excellent questions uh, thought up for everybody, but I thought we would start uh, with, with some of the ones that we had talked about before. So one other thing that I wanted to, to point out here, in the slides that follow, we're going to have the convention that the earliest timestamp is on the left and the latest timestamp is on the right. Um, so keep that in mind as, as you're going through these, these example questions here. So here we go. We got Bludgeon Brawl and we got March of the Machines. We talked about this one before. Um, and then there's four different continuous effects from just these two cards. There's four continuous effects uh, that we need to apply here. Um, and just for fun, I'm going to go ahead and put this back up on screen for you so you can uh, follow along a little bit easier. So we've got these two out and we're going to say that Dark Steel Citadel is the only uh, you know, relevant permanent that these would be able to apply to in play. So what would the characteristics of the, the Dark Seal Citadel be? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to choose the continuous effect in the earliest layer, right? So I'm going to go ahead and gray out the, the ones that are not from the earliest layer. So now we're down to just two. So if we have more than one continuous effect in this layer, then we're going to check to see if there's any dependencies, and then we're going to remove from consideration any continuous effect that's dependent on another one. Uh, we already talked about how this works. Uh, the, the Bludgeon Brawl is dependent on the March of the Machines, but the March of the Machines is not dependent upon the Bludgeon Brawl. So that would mean that this one uh, from the Bludgeon Brawl is going to get grayed out, and we're going to apply the non-creature artifacts or artifact creatures from March of the Machines. So there we go. Uh, that's uh, going to make the uh, Dark Seal Citadel into an artifact creature land. And so now um, we, we have applied this continuous effect. So now we're, we're down to just uh, uh, step three, or we're, we're down to, to you know, repeating, and, and we got to pick another uh, continuous effect to apply. So here's our choices. The, the, the one from March of the Machines making an artifact creature is already applied, so that's been removed from the list. Um, so again, we're going to take out the uh, uh, ones from the other layers. Uh, there's only one from layer four, so we're, we're going to apply that one. Except, hmm, Bludgeon Brawl did not have any non-creature, non-equipment artifacts to apply to. So that continuous effect applied uh, just did nothing because there were no objects that it could apply to. So now we have these two. Um, again, this, this one is not going to have any objects that it can apply to, so it's gone. Uh, and then finally, we have the March of the Machines giving power and toughness to, to this uh, artifact creature land that we have now. So this is kind of an interesting question here, um, which is, uh, well, hey, you know, there's still no non-creature artifacts in play, uh, right? So when we didn't apply Bludgeon Brawl's ability last layer, uh, where we didn't give this equip zero, uh, what, why not? Um, so why, why is it possible to give a power and toughness of, of zero, zero here, where it was not possible to give um, the equip ability and the other ability to Darksteel Citadel? 
And the justification we used for doing that is that there were no non-creature, non-equipment artifacts. Well, the answer is that that rule that we talked about a little bit before. Uh, if an effect should be applied um, in different layers and sublayers, it applies in the appropriate ones. And if an effect starts to apply in one layer or sublayer, it continues to apply to the same set of objects in each other applicable layer or sublayer. So that means that because the March of the Machines started to apply to this Dark Steel Citadel in layer four, that means it is continuing to apply to Dark Steel Citadel in all the other layers and sublayers. So that means it would in fact have this power and toughness given to it by March of the Machines, even though it is no longer considered to be a non-creature artifact. And so that is also the reason why the Bludgeon Brawl was not able to apply any part of its effect to the Dark Steel Citadel because the first time when Bludgeon Brawl started to apply, there were no objects meeting that criteria in play. And so therefore, in every other layer and sublayer, there's going to be no objects that Bludgeon Brawl gets to apply to. Even if we, you know, somehow manage to come up with some non-creature artifacts or non-creature non-equipment artifacts for it to apply to. Because it started out applying to zero objects, it will continue to apply to the same set of objects in each other layer. So, okay, there's that. Um, and so that that is going to be the, the end result of, of what the, the Darksdale Citadel would look like. All right, so moving on to the, the next example, we've got um, our old buddy Titania's song back, right? And you, whew, we thought we had it rough last time when there was four continuous, now there's five. There's five continuous effects, goodness me. Uh, and then, you know, of course, uh, l like I say, we're, we're going we're, we're gonna to consider this spring leaf drum as like the only thing that, that stuff could apply to. So we're going to do the exact same game as what we had done before, right? So stage one, we're going to choose the, the earliest layer. So fortunately for us, most of these are right out of the gate, not going to be in contention. Because uh, these are in later layers. So we've just got non-creature artifacts or artifact creatures. And we've got the one from March of the Machines. And we've got the one from uh, Titania Song. Um, so, you know, both of these uh, continuous effects are um, going to apply in layer 4. So because we have more than one continuous effect, we're going to check to see if any dependencies exist. We already talked about this. Each of these... Uh, continuous effects is going to be dependent on the other one because no matter which one you apply first it's going to change the number of non-creature artifacts there are for the other one to apply to right so what that means is we're going to remove from consideration any continuous effect that's dependent on another well hey guess what they're both dependent on each other so unless it's part of a dependency loop so because we have a dependency loop we're not going to remove either one of these from consideration uh, and then we're going to use timestamps to determine between the the remaining continuous effects now wouldn't you know it uh, I chose the timestamp uh, order such that I wouldn't have to mock up another uh, copy of Springleaf Drum with no abilities on it. Uh, but you could use l your imagination pretty easily and come up with a situation where the timestamps was opposite and the Titania song would actually be the, the one that would apply. Um, but because the March of the Machines has the earlier timestamp, it's the one that gets to apply. And so just like what we had in the previous one, the Titania song, when it tries to apply, uh, is going to apply to zero permanence. And so therefore, the the... Springleaf Drum will have its abilities on it because the Titania Song is not going to be able to apply to any permanence uh, when it tries to apply. All right, so now we're going to go on to another really fun one. And uh, I, again, I kind of cheated a little bit because I stole this um, from the uh, presentation that I already had on continuous effects. But uh, this is actually different, uh, a different scenario. Uh, even though it uses the same two cards, it's actually different from the one that I discussed in my uh, continuous effects presentation. So we'll see exactly why here. Now, in when I when I talk about this in my continuous effects and three easy steps presentation, there's some other cards that I have for these two to apply to. But for right now, we're going to consider that there's no permanence in play that either of these would apply to normally, right? So there's no forest, there's no saplings, there's no creatures in play. So. Uh, again, we're, we're starting like from the, the easiest version of the question. We're going to build our way up in, in complexity a little bit, right? So we've got these continuous effects that want to apply. Uh, these continuous effects want to apply in layer four. So we're going to check to see if there's any dependency. And if we apply this one first, it's not going to change anything about how many permanents this applies to or what it does or any of that other stuff. Uh, and similarly, if we apply this one first, it's not going to change anything about what permanence this one applies to or any of that other stuff. So actually, there's no dependencies here, and we can just go based on timestamp order. Um, so we'll we'll say the conspiracy has the earlier timestamp and then the life of them. So again, this is this is like kind of a toy example. There's nothing really going on here, but now you understand the rules that are 
behind nothing going on here. So it's, it's kind of uh, uh, interesting to think about there. So now we're going to move to the, the next level of this question, which is, of course, you know, maybe, maybe there is some permanence that they could apply to. So, you know, life and limb, you probably got a forest in place somewhere, right? So now let's take a look at what would happen with, with this being the case. So with this, uh, we still have these two in layer four, uh, but now we notice something kind of interesting, which is that if we apply the life and limb first, we're going to change how many permanents the conspiracy is able to apply to, right? Because now this forest would be a creature, and creatures are saprolings. Um, let's notice that we aren't going to change anything about the characteristics of this forest when the conspiracy applies to it, uh, because it's already going to be a saproling. Uh, but we are going to do is we're going to change the number of permanents that the conspiracy is able to apply to. And that is what the dependencies test says. Uh, it says if, if you change what objects it applies to. And guess what? The conspiracy would not apply to the forest before life and limb uh, applies, but it would apply to the forest after the life and limb applies. So yeah, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to think about that. But yes, that simple thing is enough to cause a dependency. Um, so yeah, therefore we would apply the life and limb first. Uh, and then we would apply the conspiracy afterwards. So, okay, of, of course, the next, you know, thing that we're thinking about is, okay, well, maybe maybe we have uh, a gutter skull can play. So usually I would use a, a grizzly bears, but this is black creature, and, and the life only makes it green, see? So that's kind of kind of fun uh, that way. Now, of course, uh, if, if we do this, then the conspiracy applying first is going to change this into a saproling. And so that would mean that the life and limb has another object to apply to. So it's... The exact same sort of thing happening as what we had previously, except this time the life and limb is going to be dependent on the conspiracy, because this time applying the conspiracy first is going to change how many objects the life and limb applies to. Um, and so that's kind of cool. Uh, depending on what permanents are in play, uh, the, the dependency situation between these two is, is actually different. Um, and that, that's something that I, I talk about in my, uh, um, another really famous, uh, example that I've, uh, talked about before. So when people talk about dependencies, uh, one question that I got one time from, from one of the people I was mentoring, they said, okay, Dave, is there a list somewhere that says like what continuous effects are dependent on which other ones? And, uh, you know, taking aside like the, the practicality aspects that it would definitely be a very long list if such a thing were to exist. Um, the answer is no. Uh, there, there is no such list of all the dependencies that exist. And um, the reason is uh, a practical one. So at first you might be wondering, well, you know, certainly the person who asked me this question was wondering, well, why not? Right? Why, why couldn't we at least in principle make a, a list of all the different dependencies? And this example highlights the reason why. Because when there were no cards in play, then there was no dependency at all between these two. When there was just a forest in play, then the life and limb um, had conspiracy dependent on it. And when there's gutter skull can play, then the conspiracy is uh, going to have the life and limb dependent on it. So it changes which, which one is dependent on which one, depending on which kind of permanence there is in play. And of course, if there's both in play, then there's a dependency loop. The conspiracy depends on life and limb, life and limb depends on conspiracy. It's like a, a big circle. Um, we, we went full circle. So... Why is that? Uh, why, why are the rules written in such a way that if you have certain permanents out, then there's a dependency, but if you have certain other permanents out, then there's not a dependency, and uh, doesn't that make things, like, super messy? And, you know, me, uh, it, it certainly is, you know, not as thematically simple, uh, but, but again, let's think about things from a practical point of view, which is that if there were an absolute dependency system where a continuous effect was only dependent on another one in an absolute sense rather than a relative sense, which is what we have now, um, then that would mean that in order to determine whether a dependency existed, we would actually have to be like thinking about whether a dependency could exist. And we would have to know if any of the cards printed in Magic's history could possibly make it so that a dependency might exist between uh, two continuous effects, which is, of course, completely infeasible. The system that we have now, at least we can just look at the board and say, okay, based on these permanents that are here right now, there is no dependency, or there is a dependency. Um, and you don't have to know what every single permanent and every single other thing that possibly could happen in a game of Magic, uh, how it would affect whether there's a dependency or not. You only have to look at the stuff that's actually there. Uh, so in that sense, it's actually a much easier and more straightforward system. Even though it does have the sort of non-intuitive result that if you 
play a permanent, a dependency might appear out of thin air or disappear out of thin air. So that's that's how that would happen. Okay, so now we're ready for, um, oh, oh boy. This, this is exciting, right? This is really exciting, everybody. So this is um, already one of my favorite questions that I ever wrote, which is blood moon plus conversion. Uh, there's a, another video that I, I talk about that. But here we're throwing in life and limb. Boy, boy, oh boy, what, a, what an exciting time to be alive. Having a, a rules question with all three of these uh, together. And th th this is probably like, well exceeds the complexity of, of something that could ever come up unless you had like an entire pot of EDH players who are all like cooperating together to make like the the most confusing, complicated judge test scenario possible. Um, but you know, if, if, if you and your friends have a Blood Moon Life and Limb conversion deck, um, you know, then here, here's how that would work. So for, for this question, we're gonna have a Saproling in play. We're gonna, we're gonna have the uh, Yold 1-1 Saproling token um, and so there's these three effects that want to apply in layer four, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to choose uh, based on timestamps, but we also have to check to see if there's any dependencies that might undermine that. Okay, so, well, let's, let's think about this for a sec. If we apply this life and limb to this sapperling, then that's going to turn the sapperling into a land. Uh, and it won't be a basic land, obviously. So that would mean that the blood moon is dependent on life and limb, because applying the life and limb first is going to change how many permanents the blood moon applies to. Now, applying the blood moon does not change how many permanents or any of the other stuff for the life and limb or the conversion, right? Uh, and the same way, applying the, the conversion first does not change anything about what the life and limb or the blood moon is gonna be doing. So that's the only dependency that there is right now, right? Uh, so we know that the blood moon, which has the earliest timestamp, is not going to get to apply. Uh, because the life and limb uh, is going to apply before the blood moon due to the dependency that we talked about. So that would mean that when we apply the life and limb, then that's going to make the sapperling token into a, uh, you know, sapperling forest land, um, just like what we talked about. But remember what we talked about. Now we have to check to see if there's any dependencies, Right? We, we don't just go based on timestamps. We, we have to go through um, and we have to choose a continuous effect again using this procedure. And so now we're going to see something really interesting, right? The, the life and limb is not here anymore because it already applied. So that's gone. Now, now we just have blood moon and conversion. But if we notice, applying blood moon first to the sapperling token is going to make the sapperling token into a mountain. Right? Now, do you know what happens when there's mountains in play? That's right, conversion gets to apply to them. Now, there is a dependency between blood moon and conversion where there wasn't one before. We applied a continuous effect and we made a dependency appear based on that continuous effect. So that's extremely exciting. Uh, this is the first time that I have ever seen this rule happen to come up. Um, and, and you you all don't know how much time I spent thinking and tinkering around and messing around with different types of stuff uh, to, to get this to work. Uh, there's there's actually all kinds of different orderings uh, for these three that you could put. I could make an entire uh, video just talking about this interaction. It would probably be about as long as this video is getting to be right now. Um, so I won't go through all the different permutations, uh, but I thought that was really exciting. Um, I, I was able to come up with a, a situation where the, the fact that we reevaluate what order the dependencies or we, we reevaluate after each continuous effect applies, what order the dependencies should be in or whether there's any new dependencies, I was able to find a situation where that actually comes up. And here it is. So yeah, after the, the uh, life and limb applies and makes the sapling to token into a, a forest, it's now gonna turn into a mountain because the blood moon applies. And then it's going to turn into a planes because uh, the conversion applies. So again, I thought that was really exciting. I hope everybody else enjoyed that too. Um, I hope everybody else has uh, at least a, a fair bit of confidence now about how uh, dependencies work. This was uh, the, the last of the examples that I had prepared. Um, and again, thank you so much to all of my patrons for supporting me on that platform. Thank you so much to everybody else who watches my videos and who spreads the word of my videos to all their friends. Um, if anybody has any other questions, definitely uh, leave them in the comments. And if anybody has any stuff that they think that I maybe like missed or overlooked, I can't um, discount that as a possibility. But if someone points out to me a mistake that I made, I will 
uh, have a pinned comment in the the bottom that explains any uh, uh, errata or clarifies anything uh, that I don't think that I did a good enough job explaining. So with that, that is all I have for you today. How did you do? Join me again next time for another daily ruling. But until then, I hope you have a great day.